John chapter 11. This particular uh, chapter is one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. And I've been looking forward to getting to this chapter. And uh, so go ahead and start reading in verse 1. It says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. And it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore a sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are, are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Notice just how clueless the disciples are. You know, once again, Jesus was often speaking in spiritual terms and in spiritual ways, and the people just wouldn't get it. And it's like, once again, this is kind of happening here. And then verse 13, how be it, Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Just, can I make it any more clear? He's dead. All right, let me speak in your language right now. In my language, reality is he's asleep, but in your language, Lazarus is dead. All right, I hate to break it to you. And then he said, but, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent of, Ye may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. So right here, we're going to stop reading here for a moment. But notice, well, I'm going to repeat this again. And I've said it many times throughout the book of John. The emphasis is just, you know, believe on him, believe on him, believe his words. Trying to get people to look at the spiritual and just believe him and just trust him. And there was many things that people could not get. There's many things the Jews weren't able to get. Because these people, they were, they were unbelievers. They did not have faith. Therefore, they did not understand many, many things that Jesus said. And they often missed very important messages. And the world, there's many things the world, they're just not going to understand because they are not spiritual. They are only carnal. They are only of the flesh. Therefore, they are not going to see the kingdom of God. And, you know, except the man be born again. Bible says he should not enter, but it also says he shall not see the kingdom of God. And we were, I was talking with Brother Lonnie before the message. You know, we've got this huge problem. I, I might be preaching on this uh, here real soon, you know, about, about the kingdom of heaven. You know, you got the Ruckmanites that are out there. They're still like the Jews, you know, preaching about this kingdom that is for the Jews. Still focused on a physical kingdom, not understanding that, no, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom of those who are of faith. And they just keep missing that, you know, these dispensationalists, they keep missing the spiritual application to these things. And I told Brother Lonnie, the only reason I think that these people just can't seem to see these spiritual things is the same reason the Jews couldn't. Because they were lost. And I hate saying that about people who call themselves Baptists and who say that they're saved. But, you know, when you can't see some very simple spiritual things i'm afraid it's because you're lost and i can't help it i'm just going to think that when you think the gospel of the kingdom that jesus preached and the gospel that paul preached are different gospels i'm going to think you're lost i can't help it it's just the uh, bible believer in me it's just the spiritual man that is in me the natural man yeah you're not going to get that you're going to see him as separate things just like the jews did but as christians if you're if you're saved, you should be able to see these things very clearly. But some important things I want you to notice in these first verses that we looked at. First of all, notice how that special love that Jesus had for Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Okay? Now I'm gonna I'm gonna get into an area here. This this is my opinion, all right? My opinion about Lazarus, Mary, and Martha is that these were three 
extremely homely people. I, I believe Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were all ugly. And you say, you know, where do you get that? Well, where do you get that they were good looking from? You get that they were good looking from all the movies. You know, that Mary Magdalene is always going to be a good looking woman on every movie and all the paintings. But listen, there's a reason we have three grown siblings all still living together. All right. And it's there. There's a good reason for that. Nobody wanted them. And I think there's a good reason for that, too. I believe that they we know this about Mary, but I believe that they before met, they met Christ were very wicked. We're very evil people. Uh, and, I, and listen, when you live a wicked life, it is going to show in your appearance. You will be ugly. But here's, the, here's one of the reasons people think that too. You know, that you see Jesus, how he was so attracted to these people, how he was so close to them, how he loved them so much. And you know what? You know, usually the nasty, ugly, homely people, they're the ones that nobody wants to be friend with. You know, every, you know it's always the good looking ones that are the popular ones. But listen, Jesus didn't think the way you and I think. Jesus was not that shallow. Jesus was not that carnal. Jesus was the Christ, and therefore, he didn't pick his friends the same way that you and I do. And I do, I believe that there was a very, there's some, some reasons we can see here that show, you know, he had a very special love for them. But notice in verse 3, it says, Therefore, his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest was sick. Okay? Jesus had a special love for Lazarus. And it says in verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now, listen, we know that Jesus loves, you know, he loves the whole world, but there was a very special love that he had for them. We know that Jesus loved all of his disciples, but who was the beloved disciple? That was John, the one who wrote the book of John. There was something special about these people. There was a special love that they had. And I believe one of the reasons too, that there, Jesus had such a special love for them I believe it was because of the love that they had for him. Once again, I think the only thing that's stopping us from having an extremely close relationship with God, it's us. God, I don't believe that God looks at any of us and like, you know what? I just, I don't like you as much as I like this person. Therefore, I'm not going to be that close to you. No, it's us that determines how close we're going to get to God. And it's very clear here. I believe that they did. They had a they had a very special love for God. Because notice, uh, for Mary, for example. All right. Now I'm not positive about some of these things. Once again, I'm going to give you a little bit of opinion here. But look what it says in verse two. When it mentions Mary, it says it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. Okay. Now we see that. It says it here in John chapter 11 like it was something from the past. But it was actually John chapter 12 where it mentions that. Okay? So, but there's another story in the Bible that's clearly not the same story as we see in John chapter 12 where something like that happens. Go back to Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. Now, I can't prove to you without a shadow of a doubt that this is Mary Magdalene right here. But many people think it was, and I think it's very possible. Matthew chapter, or Luke chapter 7, verse 36 says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the an ointment. Now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, spake within themselves, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Jesus And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. Notice whose house he's in. He's at Simon's house. And in John chapter 12, he's at Simon the leper's house. Okay? Very possible it's the same Simon. Very possible, you know, acquainted with Mary. Uh, you know, Mary Magdalene. I mean, there's just a lot of coincidences here. You know, the same thing that this woman here in Luke, Luke does is the same thing that Mary Magdalene does in John chapter 12. And so, uh, and then Jesus goes, you know, they're thinking, but they're, all, they're down on Jesus 
for even allowing this woman to touch him. Why? Because she was a very wicked woman. And so, uh, you know, I can't, I can't tell you for sure that that was Mary Magdalene, but notice what it says uh, down in verse 45. You know, he's talking to them and he says, Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say to themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Okay? So I don't, you know, I don't know for sure that that's Mary Magdalene. But you know what? This woman had been forgiven much. And because of that, she loved him much. We know that Mary Magdalene loved Jesus very much. All of them did. Mary, Martha, Lazarus. They loved Jesus. They had that desire to be around him. You have the one story where they were at Jesus. Uh, Jesus was at their house. You know, Martha, she's kind of serving. She's working hard. But Mary, what is she doing? She's sitting at his feet. She wanted to be close to him. I believe if we would have that kind of love for Jesus, we would have the same kind of relationship that they did. But unfortunately for us, you know, we sometimes think that we weren't forgiven that much. We don't realize just how great our salvation was, and so we don't appreciate it like these people did. But I believe all three of them understood how wicked they were and how much Jesus had forgiven them, and they just loved Him so much, were so drawn to Him that, you know what, it drew Jesus to them also. And he didn't care that they were ugly. He didn't care, you know, how, uh, you know, th- about their past. You know, people, all, many people too believe that it was Mary Magdalene. She was the woman that was taken in adultery and brought to Jesus. I, I don't know. Maybe that's why she, you know, because you see these stories are kind of in different gospels and it's kind of, the timelines kind of get jumbled up. But many people think that, you know, that was the first encounter when Jesus basically saved her life, kept her from getting stoned. And so then she's there at his feet, you know, just thankful. And then, you know, she ends up, you know, he forgives her those times, you know, she gets saved. You know, I don't, I don't know for sure all that, but we do know these people, they, they did, they loved him in a great way. We also know one about Mary Magdalene from Luke chapter, um, chapter eight. And this is another reason I think it's Mary Magdalene in Luke chapter seven. We have that story there that goes all the way to the end of Luke chapter seven And then in chapter 8, it says, And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Okay? So right after that, you know, is it no surprise that this woman who was at his feet would be following him like that? And notice what it says about her. He had cast seven devils out of her. Now listen, you know, it's, it's not like in Hollywood, okay? The women who are taken in adultery, these, you know, the wicked, loose women, they're not usually beautiful, okay? They're usually hideous. You know, they're usually women that most of us would be repulsed by, okay? But there's the sick pervs out there that, you know, that don't care. Mary Magdalene, she was probably one of those women. When you have seven devils in you, once again, not like in Hollywood, they just don't jump into whoever they want. People, they get deep in sin. They allow things in their life that open themselves up to these things. And when you've got devils in you, they take a toll on your body. And Jesus had cast seven of them out of her. And I do. I believe Mary Magdalene was hideous. And, and so that's just, that's just my personal opinion on that. But you know what? Jesus didn't care because they did, he'd forgiven them. He forgave her sins. And she did something that many other Christians don't do. She appreciated it. And they did. And they loved Jesus. And so Jesus did. He loved them too. Just because, and it, we could have that same thing if we would just appreciate what Jesus has done for us. And so I do, I believe that that special relationship he had for those three was a result of their love for him, their understanding of who they were and who he was. Boy, we act like the Lord is blessed to have us serving Him. That's not how these people acted. You know, we do. We act like we do God favors. You know, we act like, you know, the, well, the Lord sure was 
blessed, you know, lucky when I got saved, you know, because imagine if he'd had to go through eternity without me. That's our attitude that we have. And we wonder our relation, why our relationship with him stinks. We need to act like they did and appreciate our salvation. And so now we get into verse, so in verse 16, it says, then said Thomas, which is called Didymus unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Doubting Thomas. I preached a message a long time ago on all the words of Thomas. And if you look up all the, the phrases that Thomas said in the Gospels, all of them are like negative, doubting things. And I mean, he earned that name, Doubting Thomas. And right here's another example of that, just that, that unbelief. And we're about to see, I believe, why Jesus weeps, okay? Because these people, after all he's done, you think would have had some faith, but you know what? They didn't. And Thomas, one of his own disciples, Thomas, the faithless doom and gloom attitude he's bringing, spreading to the other disciples, getting Jesus down with it. In verse 17, it says, then uh, when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. I think that's interesting too. The, I think the four days is interesting because you know the Bible says, Thou will not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine holy one, talking about the physical body of Jesus, to see corruption. His flesh did not see corruption. It was in the dead, it was in the grave three days. But Lazarus was in the dead four days. He had already started seeing corruption. Behold, by now he stinketh. We'll see that verse in a little bit. I mean, it's too late for him to come back from the dead. Four days. As it's, it's too long. There's nothing that can be done, right? Well, verse 18, Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That event, that day, is what we call the rapture today. The resurrection of at the last day, that is the rapture. I know he'll rise again then. I know he'll rise with the dead in Christ, when the dead in Christ rise. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Keep, keep your eye on that verse, all right? Because I, once again, I'm, I might be giving my opinion a little bit here, but I'm pretty sure I'm right about something I'm going to say here in a little bit. Remember that verse. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. That's not what Jesus asked. That is not what Jesus asked her. He asked, you know, he that believeth in me shall never die. Believe us how this. I believe you're the Messiah. Okay, you know, have your kids ever tried pulling that one on you before? Where they, you ask them, you know, hey, did you do, you know, were you the one that, you know, spilled that drink or something? You know, and then it's like they try to change the subject. Uh, I didn't make that mess and they'll like point to something else. <laughs> you know, it's like, the, it's like they want to deny, but they know they can't lie. And so it's like they do, they, they like def deflect things and they start trying to talk about something else. Teenagers are the worst at doing that. Okay. When I was a youth director, teenagers used to do that all the time. You always had to be very careful how you phrased your questions, because if you weren't a hundred percent accurate in how you phrased it, they felt like they could deny the whole thing. And let me tell you something. I never could beat other people's kids when they did that. But I, man, when my kids do that, that infuriates me. And that's kind of what Martha's doing here. Jesus has asked her a hard question. You know, that's a pretty big statement. And he's like, believe us out of this. Well, she doesn't want to say, I don't believe. So what does she do? Well, I believe you're the Christ. You know, I, she, she kind of changes the subject of things, what's going on here. There's not a whole lot of faith. She's trying to have faith. 
But she really didn't. You know, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother had, wouldn't have died. That's how much faith I have in you. I have enough faith to believe that if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. You could have healed him of his sickness. But you can't raise him from the dead. She didn't say that. Once again, she's, she's trying to convince herself and convince Jesus that she has some faith. You know, but I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus said there, thy brother shall rise again. I know he'll rise. I know he's going to rise at the rapture. You know, I'm trying to be strong. I'm trying to have faith. You're, you're trying to tell me something here. You know, I, I get all that. I know that's coming. But it's very clear she is trying to have faith, but she doesn't quite have it. Look what it says in verse 28. And when he, uh, when she said so, or, and when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister secretly saying, the master has come and called for thee. And as soon as she heard that she arose quickly and came unto him. Now, Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. The Jews then, when they were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her saying, she goeth unto the grave to weep there. I love that verse in the Bible because I do. I just picture, you know, these nosy Jews all hanging around. The drama's all there. There's been a death in the family and they're all, they're all around comforting her. And she clearly is trying to get away from everybody. You know, they secretly send this message to her. She hurries up and gets up, runs off to leave. Why? What's she doing? I don't know. She just ran off. You know what? I'll bet she's going to the grave to cry some more. Well, you know, you'd think people would have taken that as a signal. Well, maybe we ought to leave her alone. But no, where the drama's at, everybody wants to go. So what do they do? They all go run out to the grave too. You know, I, I, I want to see this. If I hear that there's somebody crying somewhere, that's the last place I want to go. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of people, women. I, <laughs> I mean, it's like they do. They gravitate towards that stuff. And, you know, I, I, sh I shouldn't say stuff in stereotype like that. But uh, that's just... That, when I read that, that's what I'm picturing in my mind. But notice in verse 32, Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. They are with Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, and everybody's crying. Everybody's groaning and it's causing him to groan. And he said, where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see Jesus wept. Okay. G and I do not believe that Jesus wept because Lazarus was dead. I believe he wept because of the lack of faith in that crowd. After all he had done, they still are struggling with faith. They are in the very presence of the resurrection and the life. They are the very, in the very presence of the Creator, the one I mean, who, who can save souls, who had done miracle after miracle, and here they are crying. And Jesus groaned within Himself. This, I believe this lack of faith greatly disturbed Him. And you know, it's a sad day whenever Christians lose hope in any situation. I do. I believe we grieve Lord, all the time with our constant just doom and gloom. I mean, after all he's done for us, look how much we worry. Look how much we complain. Look how much we despair. I could preach a whole message just on that. And listen, I'm preaching to myself. We all do it sometimes. We all. I mean, we all despair. We all get worried about things we shouldn't worry about. I mean, he comes through for us time after time after time, yet we still worry. And I believe that bothers him greatly. I believe that's why he wept here. And Jesus, he is, he's weeping after all he had done. They still don't have any hope. And so look at verse 36. Then said the Jews, behold, how he loved him. They think he's crying because he just loved Lazarus that much. And he's sad that he's dead. And some of them said, could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died a little bit of faith, you know, just like Mary and Martha, you know, he could have stopped them from dying, but can he raise the dead? Nobody, that's not even on anybody's radar. You know, even Martha, it was like, she almost alluded to it. You know, whatever you ask God could do, but I know that's asking a lot. And so she, she didn't ask. And it says in uh, verse 38, Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. 
it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take ye away the stone, Martha. The sister of him that was dead set, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. For he hath been dead four days. Obviously, she was not expecting him to raise her brother from the dead. Because you're like, Lord, why would we take the stone away? Why would we do this? He's going to stink. It's too late. Verse 40, Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Jesus isn't praying for himself. He's praying for everybody else. Jesus isn't saying these things because he's trying to tell himself or he's trying to talk to God. He's doing this because everyone needs to hear what he's about to say. In verse uh, 43, And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. Okay, now, I want to... Here, here's a deep theological question to think about. This is something we could probably argue about if we want, but I, I have my extremely strong opinion on this here. Whose faith caused Lazarus to resurrect? Because we see in the Bible that Christ, whenever he was limited, it wasn't because of Christ. It was because people didn't have any faith. You know, he did not many mighty works because of their unbelief. You know, he was, you know, if thou believest, you'll see these things. So whose faith was it that caught, that allowed this miracle to take place? Okay. Was it, was it Martha? I mean, while it doesn't appear she has any faith, well, when he told her to get, you know, move the stone, she had the stone removed. So was it, you know, the fact she had just enough to move the stone that raised him from the dead? So was it, was it Martha? Or I've heard some say that, you know, it was the faith of Jesus. Jesus was the, you know, he was the only one that had faith there. Clearly nobody has any faith and Jesus did it. But the problem with that is if it was the faith of Jesus, then how come he didn't do more miracles when he was in Nazareth? Cause Nazareth, cause he obviously had the faith whose faith that was there present was the faith that was needed for Lazarus to be raised from the dead. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Lazarus. I believe it was Lazarus that had the faith. Now, wait a minute. He's dead. How can he have any faith? All right, here's a good thought. This is a good passage for the Calvinists too. Say, no, you're dead. You know, dead people can't have faith. Dead people can't believe. Dead people can't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, God has to regenerate them. Then they believe. Then they call on the Lord Jesus Christ. But wait a minute. Look at what it says you know, back in verse um, 25. In verse 25, it says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Okay, now, see, he's dead. How can he have any faith? Well, listen, Lazarus did believe on Christ. Lazarus was a man of faith. Lazarus was a man who was saved. And when Jesus called out, called out to him, even though he was dead, he still rose from the dead. Well, and you say, that doesn't make any sense. Well, actually, well, go back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I think it makes perfect sense. I think what we saw here is extremely similar to to something that is yet to come. John chapter 5, verse 25 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that shall hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves 
shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. And we know later from first Thessalonians chapter four, that the dead in Christ rise first. There is a day coming when all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. What's going to happen? All of those who are believers, all of those who are of faith, who are dead before the rapture comes, Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to do the same thing he did with Lazarus. He cried out with a loud voice. What does 1 Thessalonians 4.16 say? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. What is he going to, what's he shouting? He's going to be shouting, Tommy, come forth. You know, Lonnie, come forth. He's going to call out our names to come forth. And even though we are dead, those of us who are of faith, who believe, we're going to resurrect from the dead, aren't we? And the dead, the dead in Christ will rise first. And just like Lazarus rose from the dead, we also will rise from the dead. We, we will hear that voice. So I believe when we see it, what we see there in John chapter five, behold, the time is coming and now is, well, we have that time coming where there is that physical resurrection where those who are dead are going to hear his voice and they're going to rise. But the time now is where those who are dead in trespasses and sins, they hear the voice of God. They hear the message of salvation. They hear the gospel. And when they believe, what happens? They resurrect from the dead spiritually. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. I believe there's a dual meaning there. There's a, spir- there's a spiritual meaning and there's a physical meaning there too. And, and Lazarus, he did. He was able to hear the voice. Why? Because first of all, Jesus called out to him who is the resurrection of the life. And Lazarus, he, he was a believer. He was of faith. I've heard many preachers say this, and I agree. You know, he's there in the graveyard. If Jesus would have just said, come forth, well, everybody would have come forth. But no, he was specific. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, Lazarus heard, and Lazarus rose from the dead. And, I, and so I believe the faith that got Lazarus resurrected from the dead was the faith of Lazarus. Not anyone else there. That person laying in the grave was one of faith. Well, you know, Jesus said, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? And I know there's going to be some people here of faith. There's not going to be a lot of faith. But let me tell you something. There's dead bodies all over this world that are dust by now. But you know what? When Jesus Christ comes back, it's not going to matter if there's people around them of faith. When he calls out their name and tells them to come forth, when he descends from heaven with a shout, that the faith of those people who are in those graves is going to be what gets them out of the grave because they had faith in Jesus Christ and they will come forth. And Jesus Christ, he proved that he can do that. He proved that he will be able to raise us from the dead in the future. He proved that he can raise us from the dead spiritually right now by that very miracle that he did. And yes, yes, even those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, they can hear the voice of God. And if they will believe, if they will call on the Lord, they can be saved. That time now is where that can happen. And so uh, I I believe it was Lazarus' faith. And Jesus, he was, he's showing Martha, he's showing everyone that what the resurrection of the last day was all about. Martha, I know he'll rise at the resurrection of the last day. Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. I am that resur- I am that resurrection. Let me prove it to you. And he did. With the shout, Lazarus, he came forth. And so this miracle, uh, we'll tur- uh, look at verse 45. Let's read the rest of this chapter. It says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believe on him, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. You know, it's hard to believe that there were still some unbelievers after seeing this, you would think after seeing a man brought back from the dead after four days that everyone would believe. Now, listen, Jesus had raised other people from the dead, but most of those people were newly dead. You know, it would have been easy for the Pharisees to say, ah, they weren't totally dead. They were in a coma. 
you know, they were faking, whatever. But when a guy's been dead four days, wrapped up in grave clothes, you know, already smelling like a corpse, there's no denying that. There's, there's no getting past that. But they did. So they're, they're going and they're telling the Pharisees, they need to know about this because this is going to spread and it's not going to be good. And then, so then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our places, a place and the nation. Part of the Pharisees' problem with not accepting Jesus is they were afraid of Rome coming down on them. And so they, their fear of Rome helped stop them from following Christ. And it's funny because there's a lot of religious people, a lot of churches, a lot of preachers that are afraid to preach the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You know why? Because they're afraid of Caesar. They're afraid of the government. They're afraid of you know, losing their tax-exempt status. You know, they're afraid of persecution. And so they do, they, you know, they're, they refuse to do the right thing. They refuse to do what they know they should thinking, you know, this is for a noble cause. You know, we're trying to protect Israel. And if, if, if this guy keeps getting his way, everybody's going to follow him and Rome's not going to like it. And there's going to be a battle and people are going to die. And you know what? If that's the same attitude today. You know, you've got these multi-million dollar ministries that are out there that have these big fancy buildings and all these great things that they have built. And the last thing they need to be doing is getting in trouble with the government. Because what, you know, we, we can't allow them to come and take what we have. Well, why not? Those are just buildings. Those are just things. It's only money. We're about souls that are worth more than all those things. And these people are compromising left and right because they're scared of Caesar. They're scared of Rome. They're scared of Babylon is what it is. And we shouldn't fear those things. And, uh, and, but that, that it, it got them in trouble. And so verse uh, 49, And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that this is expedient for us, that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. They're trying to make sure Caiaphas's uh, prophecy comes to pass. You know, that somebody dies for the people and it be Jesus. Jesus, therefore, walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim. And there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think ye that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he was, he should show it that they might take him. So after once again, Jesus' miracles that were only good, always got him in trouble. Healing people got, would get him in trouble, you know, healing, pe uh, healing people of their blindness, and raising someone from the dead pretty much got him a death sentence. They were determined to kill him, to put him down. And so, uh, you know, th that miracle, the reason for that, it, it, was, it was so great, it was so public, that it left the Jews only two choices. Either believe him, or get rid of them. Kill them. And we all know what they end up doing. They ended up having them crucified. And listen, there, there was and there is no excuse for not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who don't get saved, they will go to hell because they rejected him. Turn over to, we'll close right here with at Romans chapter 1. Turn over to Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, 
so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You all see that? There's no excuse for not believing Christ. God has manifested in them. These things from the creation of the world, the Bible says, are clearly seen. Well, then why can't some people see him? You know why? Because they love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Why can't we get some of these people? You know, why can't we even get some of these preachers to see some of the things that are so clear in the Bible? Why can't we get the Rachmanites to see that there has always been one way of salvation? It's always been by grace through faith. It always will be. Why can't they see that? Why? Because that's a spiritual message and the natural man can't receive that. That's harsh. That's the only way I can think to explain why they can't see these things. Why didn't the Jew, why weren't the Jews able to understand that Jesus was the Messiah when he made it so clear? You know why? Because they loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They rejected. They rejected truth. Why is it, you know, we see these people who live in these wicked pagan nations. And a lot of times people think, you know, it's not fair that they go to hell. What chance do they have, you know, living in a pagan nation like that? Listen, it's got, it got that way because they love darkness rather than light. I believe if they, you know, if you know, God manifests himself to them too, and if they would go to that light, I believe they would get saved. But they don't. They reject. And the Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And anyone who rejects Christ is a fool. And I, and I, do, I believe that there are, there's no excuses for people. And listen, let's not take that verse and rely on that and say, well, you know, we don't even need to give the gospel to people. No, listen, it's our job to give the gospel to people. It's our job to spread the gospel to everyone we can. But listen, when people don't get saved, it's, it's their fault. And they're going to be cast in the lake of fire for it. There is no excuse. And Jesus Christ, he did. What more could he have done than what he did at that very moment? Well, he could have shown them the Father. Well, that would have killed them if they saw the face. If they, if they saw the face of God, you know. And here's the other thing too: you can't get saved without faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And I believe that's one of the reasons too. He often spoke in parables and maybe even did some miracles where maybe there was some room or some reason you could doubt. Why? Because these people need to have faith. And these people too that are preaching that when Jesus Christ returns and every eye sees Him, all the Jews are going to get saved then after they see Him? Well, then where's the faith? That's salvation without faith. That's never happened. Hebrews 11 proves there's never been salvation without faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And we, and we see here that I think, I mean, to me, to see Jesus raise somebody from the dead after they've been dead four days, the Bible says many believed on, on him. I'm surprised that even counted as faith. But apparently it did. It, apparently, apparently that did count, that still counted as faith. And you do, you have, there, there is no excuse to not have faith. Jesus Christ, he is the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead. And thank God, at one time we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We heard the gospel message. We called on the Lord. He saved us. One of these days, if the Lord tarries is coming, we will be dead physically. But that won't stop us from hearing his voice. And when he calls out, we will, we will rise. And one way or the other, we are going to experience the rapture. And I'm looking forward to that. So with that, let's all stand together.